to Northwest Author Series sponsored by the Cannon Beach Library. We welcome you today, Saturday. It's a pretty sunny day out here in Cannon Beach. Yeah. I hope you're enjoying yourself uh, wherever you are. Today is the first day of our 2021-22 year. The Northwest Author Series presents an author every month for nine months out of the year. Today is our uh, our first day and Dana Haynes is our first author of the year. Dana Haynes is the author of nine published mysteries and thrillers from Blackstone Publishing, St. Martin's Press, and Bantam Books. He has had short stories appear this year in Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queen Mystery Magazines. His latest series of books kicked off in 2019 with St. Nicholas, Salvage and Wrecking. It was followed this year with the sequel, Sirocco, and will be followed next year by The Saint of Thieves. Dana is the editor and chief of the Portland Tribune, an award-winning, he's an award-winning journalist and a former political speech writer. He lives in Portland with his wife, Katie King and their cat, Violet. So let me welcome Dana Haynes. Hi, Dana. How are you? I am really doing great. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and Nancy, I know that you live with your cat, and so I thank him as well. Um, <laughs> really, really glad to be here. Super, uh, super honored. Uh, we, my wife and I, Katie and I, love this library. We love all libraries, but but Cannon Beach Library has a special place in our hearts. Wanted to thank uh, Phyllis Burns and all the other members of the board for being here. Also wanted to point out that Cannon Beach has one of the great indie bookstores in all of Oregon, the Cannon, Cannon Beach Bookstore. Um, and um, Oregon has this, this string of gems of, of independent bookstores. And when I go to the murder mystery thriller conventions, I often hear people say, oh yeah, my state has one independent bookstore or my, we used to have one and we just have many of them here and they're wonderful. And so everybody out there who supports your local library, keep doing that. Everybody out there who supports your local indie bookstore, keep doing that. They are just, uh, they're a mitzvah, they're a blessing. Uh, I also want to just take one moment to acknowledge that this is the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, I think all of us know where we were when we heard about the uh, terrible attacks on the United States. All of the, uh, the people who died and the people who were injured and wounded and the people who later got sick and have suffered. And we also know that Oregon has a slight small uh, story uh, role in that. In my Portland Tribune this, this week, we got stories of firefighters who grabbed their turnouts, ran to the airport and jumped on a plane before they got the permission from their chief fire chief to do it and flew to New York to help recover bodies at ground zero. We also have stories of people who went on the freedom trips that uh, Azumano Travel put together and which uh, uh, Vera Katz, then mayor of Portland led and how important that was uh, to, to the city. And we have remembrances of many people who were there back then. So. Um, this is a, a solemn occasion, and I thank everybody who's joining us to talk about something a lot more joyous than that. Um, I was also going to take a quick moment to, uh, and I hope you don't mind if I do this, but urge everybody to get vaxxed. Uh, uh, the reason I say that is my father is 91 years old. Uh, he has dementia. He lives in North Idaho, and uh, he was diagnosed uh, this week with uh, cor the coronavirus. Um, he can't get into the hospital because the unvaccinated people in Idaho have pushed the capacity of the Idaho uh, hospitals well beyond their capacity. So uh, he, they sent him home to my mom and she's taking care of a 91-year-old with uh, uh, COVID-19. So I'm asking everybody, if you could please, please get vaxxed. Um, also during this, I was gonna point out to you that I'm doing this from my home, obviously. Uh, from time to time, you might hear uh, Violet, the cat, uh, communicating with you. She will be telling you that she has not yet had lunch. I just want you to know that in this matter, she is an unreliable narrator. All right. So don't trust her. Um, quickly, the series. Uh, Michael Finnegan and Catalin Fierro de Har, they're my protagonists. They uh, run a business called St. Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking out of Cyprus. And their job is to find the worst of the world's worst criminals and to tie them in a, a pretty bow and take them to the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court, by the way, uh, does not have its own police force. There's no law enforcement arm to the International Criminal Court. So their job is to have these guys show up from time to time, uh, these bad guys, and, and then and get uh, uh, literally taken to court. Um, so that was an exciting idea on my part. The other thing I'm really, really excited about is that Michael Finnegan and Kathleen Fierro de Har are the protagonists. We don't have a hero and a sidekick. 
we've got two co-equal protagonists who are not love interests, man and a woman, not love interests, best friends, very differing skill sets. Michael was a cop in New York City and thinks like a cop. Catalan Fierro de Har uh, grew up uh, as an athlete, uh, uh, competed in the Olympics for Spain, where she's from, and was a soldier and a spy and an assassin for king and country. So very different people, but I really, really wanted the dynamic of having two protagonists who are co-equals and not love interests, because I read a lot of mysteries and a lot of thrillers, and I had not seen that dynamic. So that was something I was really interested in. Hmm. This coffee cup, coffee cup is from a Shakespeare and Company, Kilomètre Zero in Paris, talking about great independent bookstores that you need to support. That's one of them, but I digress. I also want to say I am with um, Blackstone, Blackstone Publishing, whom I love. They're awesome. Uh, they're really, really good to authors. They really treat us well. And they have offices in uh, New York City and Ashland, Oregon. And I was wondering why they have Office of National Organ. And the answer is that Blackstone initially was an audio book house before they were a print book house. And you can find a whole lot of people with really good voices who are out of work in National Oregon. So they can find narrators down there. So the, uh, the uh, audio version of this one of the books, this is St. Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking, the first one, was narrated by Victor Bevine, who is a tremendous, tremendous uh, narrator. Uh, quick story to tell, I had to go to uh, the uh, a, a bookstore in, in the cent in Central Oregon, and while I was driving there, I was listening to my own book because I'd never done that before. And uh, while driving back, listening to my book, and I thought at one point, "Gee, I wonder what's going to happen next." Oh wait, I know what happened next. I wrote the damn book. But he, he, Victor was so good, and he had me so in the narrative, it's so in the moment that I, for a moment, forgot that I was listening to something I that I know quite well. Uh, Victor also tells he's a really nice fellow, by the way, just a sweetheart of a guy, and he also tells me that he narrated the Mueller report. And I like to say that's pretty interesting, but that I have a better Act Three. So um, enough of that. Uh, Scirocco, uh, uh, just as, as uh, our hosts said, it is the second of three in the Finnegan and Fierro trilogy, the St. Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking series, uh, this under the radar illegal globetrotting operation that finds bad guys. Um, and uh, the Saint of Thieves is coming out next year, it's scheduled to be released in fall of 2022. It's all written, so I have to wait quite a while for that one. And I should tell you that I have two more books coming out in uh, one in 2022 and one in 2023. Can't talk about them yet. They're from another publisher, but next year I'm going to have the honor of having two books from two publishers. I've never done that before and I'm over the moon. So um, uh, what can I tell you about Shiraka? Real, real, real quickly, I was going to read a passage from it. I need you to know that uh, to write this book, uh, I got to travel. I had the luxury of traveling to Cyprus and to Spain. And I also made up a fictional country in North Africa. It's near between Egypt and Chad sort of. Um, and so that's where these scenes in this book take place. Uh, the first book, uh, uh, St. Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking, was Cyprus again, because that's their headquarters, a country that I adore, by the way, and the former Yugoslavia and France. So um, let me tell you a little bit about this passage before I read it. You're going to be hearing about the Kamsin Sayef, or the Sword of the Father. It's um, a terrorist organization. It's been bombing places in Europe over the last three years. They killed an officer of a private military contractor called Sooner Sly and Rydell, or Suicide Ride. Um, uh, and this private contractor has been interfering with the investigations of the CNI, of the CIA, and Spain's equivalent of the CIA, the CNI, ever since. So the station chief for the CIA, Annie Pryor, the Madrid station chief, and Hugo Yant, who is the um, CNI guy who used to be Fierro's boss when she'd been assassinated and would like to have her back, they come to the decision that these two people, Michael and Catalan, could investigate this terrorist organization and without Sooner Sly and Rydell breathing down their necks. So this passage uh, is about Michael and Catalan, how they work, their friendship, their, uh, the, and the resources they bring to each other. Because as a reader myself, I'm always fascinated on how people do the jobs they do. So that's why I've picked this passage. All right, here we go. A little water. Also, I should tell you, the lovely thing about reading passages and Zoom meetings like this is I brought it up as a Word document and I put it at 18 point because my eyes ain't what they used to be. So here's this passage in 18 point. Michael Finnegan and Catalan Fierro de Har let their friends know they might be back in business after a dry spell. It's always good to let you know who's available at the start of a gig. Finnegan thought, just in case. Their friends were an unusual assortment of ne'er-do-wells, as his grandmother would have said. They included a corrupt banker who was to money laundering what Yasha Heifetz is to the fiddle. 
a Scottish mercenary who could put together an army at a moment's notice, and a crew of subcontracting thieves and con men known as the Black Hearts. Finnegan, son of a cop, grandson of a cop, and had his soul a cop through and through, wasn't all that comfortable with the friends they'd established. Fierro, a soldier, a spy, an assassin at heart, believed that the, all jobs fall into one of two categories, win and lose. And whatever rules you got to bend to stay out of that second category were fine by her. If sometimes that made for uncomfortable feelings between the partners, well, no business model is perfect. As for the Kamsin Saif, the great god Google provided all the answers, as it tends to in the first hours of any investigation. The partners got home and Fierro went for a run, which would end at her dojo in a strenuous workout, and Finnegan hit the books. After making a name for itself in the Paris bombings three years early in the, earlier, the Kam Sin Saif had laid low for a while, but this year they'd come back with a vengeance, launching three strikes in eight months. The first was at a bank in Geneva, taking out two of the bank's mid-level officials and six others in an adjacent office. Next in May, they hit a cafe in the lake town of Annecy, France. Again, they showed no mercy for family, killing an engineer who had designed a dam for the newly emerging government of al Shark in, in Africa. Then the terrorists hit Victor Wu in Barcelona, killing three of the operatives of the American military intelligence contractor Sooner Sly and Rydell, and thus hamstringing any investigation by either the Spanish or American spy agencies. <coughs> which led to Hugo Llorent and Annie Pryor to reach out to St. Nicholas Salvage and Wrecking. Finnegan was so, uh, simultaneously pleased and worried that the CNI and CIA knew about their business. He and Farrell thought their cover as a marine salvage broker had kept them off the radar of most government agencies, but it seems that assessment had been wildly optimistic. A messenger delivered a flash drive to their Kyrenian office over the Turkish restaurant that afternoon. Finnegan opened the package to find a flash drive, but no note, no letter, no instructions. He fit the drive into an extra laptop they stored in a closet in case the drive was infected and found the entire case file of the Kamsin Saif, courtesy of the Spanish Centro Nacional de la Inteligencia. As the day wore on, Finnegan studied everything he could find on the flash drive and found on the internet about the terrorists on the bombings. Fierro hated inactivity and she was prohibitively bad at research. She'd been that overly smart and underser underserved student in schools, bored and troublesome, with an irksome quality of memorizing all her lessons instantaneously, then disrupting the class for everyone. When Finnegan was in research mode, Fierro knew to clear out to her dojo to go running in the craggy mountain range behind the village or to take up a new sport like scuba diving or hang gliding. Finnegan was much the opposite, not a naturally good student, but bad grades meant disappointing his mom and who needs that? He fit in homework around pickup games of basketball at the J on Victory Avenue on Staten Island. He never had to worry about career counseling. His grandfather and his father and his uncles had all been cops. His path was laid out for him, or so he thought. While Fierro went running, Finnegan remained cooped up and enjoyed it. He'd read for an hour, then go clean something, make their beds, fold the laundry, scare out the coffee maker. This was his version of research Tai Chi, read, putter, ponder, repeat. And after a full day of Finnegan's research, Fierro brought home a curry takeaway for dinner. Her parents may have been Cordon Bleu trained, but Catalan's culinary experts, expertise began and ended with Top Ramen. So that's just a sense of who these folks are and, 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 and the, the, the differing skill sets that they bring to the table. When there's time for sleuthing, Michael's the dude. If there's time for violence, he always backs up and let Cat, lets Catalan handle it because she's better at it. So that really enjoy, I really enjoy playing with those dynamics. I have to tell you, too, that uh, I mentioned Kyrenian. Uh, the town of Kyrenia is, uh, hugs the coast, uh, the northern coast of Cyprus. Uh, on a clear day, you can see Turkey. And for those of you who, like me, are geographically challenged, Cyprus is in the eastern Mediterranean, right? And Turkey is at 12 o'clock. And uh, Syria and Israel would be at 3 o'clock. And Egypt would be at 6 o'clock. And um, some weird thing of the trade winds means it's always about 80 degrees in Cyprus, which is 120 in some of those other countries. So it's incredibly pleasant. There are two um, British military bases there. So everybody speaks English. You can't get a bad cup of coffee and you can't get a bad meal because two thirds of the, of the islander is Greek and one third is Turkish. So if you're like me or have a ca bad caffeine habit, Cyprus is the place to be. So I, I was really fortunate to go and travel there. And the Kyrenia is just a magical jewel box uh, of, a, of, a, of a town. It's got an Ottoman fortress looming over it from one side. Uh, it used to belong to the Venetians at one point. In fact, that's the assignment that Othello had before he got, gets called back to Venice in the play Othello. And that posting didn't go well for him. Spoiler. Um, anyway, uh, I, I just, Cyprus is awesome. 
So the next one coming up is Saint of Thieves, uh, as we have said before. And I had mentioned the the uh, the, the the thieves and con men who work with uh, Michael and Catalan. They're known as um, uh, uh, the, the, the Black Hearts, and their leader is a woman named Sally Blue. And I bring this up because she is the topic of two of the three short stories that I've sold recently. The, 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 the thieves are the subject of these two short stories. And I'm not a short story writer, so I'm super, super pumped that I got to write those. And I'm super pumped that, I, that this book takes place in Venice. I got to tell you, Katie and I, we're heading to Venice in about 20 days. And I am jacked. I, we haven't had a vacation in two years. I am as tired a person as you'll ever met. And we're just, we're just excited. You know, we're vaccinated. We got our N95 masks. We're going. Um, I love Venice for a number of reasons. It's the most ro romantic city in the world. Um, it's just amazing. We've uh, two years running before the pandemic. And now this year, we, uh, Katie had found us an apartment uh, that, that's inside a palazzo. And uh, it's got a kitchen. And I'm a fairly decent chef. Uh, not chef. I'm sorry, a cook. And then it's got a balcony and it look, the balcony looks over at, and by the way, when I mentioned Katie King, this would be Katie King right here, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. I've just been, I've just been photobombed. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome. So my prop fell down and returned for which I got a kiss. And I got to tell you, honestly, I am net ahead. That was all good. That I'm fine. Um, where was I? You know, um, we, uh, I like to cook and we have a little balcony that overlooks a working class canal. And so we'll spend the day, I take with me a shopping bag, an apron and a paring knife. And then we spend the day shopping for what we're going to make that night for dinner. And then we make, I make a dinner and we'll sit outside and have a four hour uh, meal over our, over our canal until the mosquitoes drive us in. And it's just, it's the most romantic city in the world. One of the things I like to, um, uh, say about Venice, and why it's so bizarre and it's why it's amazing is, um, in fact, in fact uh, Sally Blue, the character uh, who's the thief, has this dialogue in the next book. She said, see that uh, bridge over there? 600 years ago, a brewer on this side needed to get to a bordello on that side. So they put their money together and they built a, a bridge. And it's here today, 600 years later. There's no urban planning in Venice. Venice was put together as a mishmash. It's completely illogical. Uh, Pisa is, is pleased they have one building that leans. Every building leans in Venice. Um, uh, it's Mark Twain told his friends, you should go see Venice quickly because it won't be here in a couple of years. You said that in 1880s. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it, I absolutely adore it. And um, the other thing that's amazing about it is, um, how do I put this? Imagine you had a London street map and you can see the streets of London, right? On your map and you turn it over and you got the subway map, the, the, the underground, the tube, right? In, in Venice, you see both maps simultaneously overlaid upon each other. And the reason for that is if you're on a boat in a canal going that direction, or if you're in the fundamenta, the sidewalk, if you will, going that direction, they'll take you to different places. Um, the, the, it's, it's, such a, it's such a bizarre, bizarre uh, maze of streets. And um, if you ever ask somebody in Venice, hey, how do I get to St. Mark's Square? How do I get to the Rialto Bridge? How do I get to the train station? They'll always say, dritto, dritto, sempre dritto. It means keep going straight, keep going straight, keep going straight. And the reason they'll say that no matter where you are is because it's a damn island. You can't get that lost. It's not even a big island. And every few corners, you'll see a sign that says Piazza San Marco that way or Rialto Bridge that way or the uh, uh, Stazione Ferroviaria that way. I love how uh, uh, realistic Italian language. It's ferroviaria means uh, iron road, right? Which is what a, which is what a train station is. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's great. I love it. And uh, we, we stay on a quiet little uh, campo or a square away from all the other tourists. The only people out at night in our campo are grandmothers that are telling your grandchildren to stop horsing around. Um, so it's super. I thought at this point I could stop and see if there are any questions and we could go to questions and I can go back to talking about uh, stuff or if, if that works for our hosts. Uh, is that good or do you want me to keep going for a while and then we'll do questions a little bit, little bit deeper in? I don't think we have any questions forwarded, but I do have a couple of questions for you. I'll take them. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to know, how do you get your ideas? I mean, have you been an assassin in the past? Uh, is there anything uh, in your history that we should know about? Uh, how about being a cop? Have you been a cop? 
I know you probably covered cops as a journalist, but um, how do you how do you get those uh, characters and how how do you get your ideas? You're very prolific. So how do you do that? I am prolific. I write really fast. I can write the first draft of a novel in three months. So that's pretty quick. Um, and um, the, I had done four books when I was with um, uh, St. Martin's Press. And when that contract was done and I was leading to move on to another house, you can't really transport a series from one house to another because the second house doesn't want to promote books that were published by the first house, right? So if you go to a new publisher, you pretty much got to come up with new characters. And in this case, for me, it was, I'm a journalist. And I discovered doing some research on another story that um, the International Criminal Court in The Hague does not have a police department. It's got lawyers and judges and clerks and researchers and all of that stuff, but it doesn't have any law enforcement arm. So I thought, well, okay. So in the real world, there is an actual gap missing about how do you get people. Some of you, uh, some of our, your fans are going to remember that Slobodan Milosevic uh, uh, was tried at The Hague, but it took him 25 years to get him there, and then he died of a heart attack before the trial happened. The, uh, one, of the, one of the butchers of the uh, Yugoslavian uh, Civil War. Well, that, but you know, he never he never got a verdict because he died before that was done. So I thought in the real world, there's a there's a gap missing. There's this is a job that doesn't really exist. And I had never read this in any other book. So I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. So let me start with that premise that there's somebody whose job it is to kidnap criminals and dump them on, on, in front of the court, court in The Hague. That seemed cool to me because first off, you can write it dozen stories with this. It's very unlimiting as far as future stories would go. So I was excited about that. Second thing is I really, 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 really wanted to have the thing I mentioned earlier, which was the co-equal protagonists were not lovers. That just, oh boy, that was such an interesting dynamic to me that, um, cause I'd never seen anybody else do that. Uh, so that, those are the two things that I really, really wanted to do. So then once I have a a setting, which is in this case that uh, the somebody who delivers bad guys, and I have a couple of characters. Then I start playing around um, with uh, a, a basic story, which has a beginning and a middle and an end. And for the first one, I really wanted to do something about um, the Syrian refugees because I wrote it at the, at the height of that crisis, and they were inundating Europe, and Europe was. Uh, responding to them really well, Germany, or really poorly, Poland. Uh, and I, for, forgive me, that's, that's a perspective on my part. So I thought, okay, that's a dynamic that's really pretty interesting. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, print journalist. So a lot of my stories, if you'll please forgive this, are ripped from the headlines. I actually hate that term, but that's what they use. I also am not an outliner. I am a what people in the industry sometimes refer to as a seat, as a pantser or a seat of the pantser. So I don't do outlines. So I will start. Um, my wife's a, a novelist as well, and Katie has these intricate outlines. So she knows every step of what she's going to write. This comes, then this comes, then this comes, and they're very organic. Whereas, and I'll sit down and start writing what seems like an interesting idea, and I'll write it, and I'll write it, and I'll write it until it's not until I think, yeah, that's pretty good. I, th I think it's pretty good. Or nope, doesn't work. I'm going to erase forty pages and start over. Uh, Katie, bless her, would have a cardiac incident if she had to erase 40 pages. And I do it fairly regularly. She refers to it as the 40 page cul-de-sac, but I eh, just got to back out of it and start over again. Um, and eventually I will get to a point where I'll wake up one morning. I'll think, oh my God, I'm really excited to see what happens next. I can't wait to get into it. And that's when I know I got myself a story. Um, there was a, um, a the, one of the books that's coming up next year that I can't talk about right now because it's not, it's not public yet. Um, I, the protagonist was going to be like a sheriff from uh, 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 the uh, Imperial Valley in California on the Mexican border, and he's going to be a big tall fellow. And I wrote 20 pages of that and thought, no, nah, it's not interesting. And then he was going to be um, a, a, a Afghan vet who gets back and is living in that town and wrote 20 pages of that and said, nah, just not happening. And then he was going to be, after a while, I thought he was going to be a foreigner. I decided to be an Englishman who was in the United States. And I wrote one for a guy who was a retiree, 55-ish or so. Um, didn't like that one and ripped it up. Started another one. Came up with a name. There was a different name for every one of those iterations. Finally came up with the iteration that I shan't talk about right now. Different name. Uh, different characters started writing it and it clicked like that. That was going to be it. And I just knew it's got the secret sauce. I can't tell you how to replicate it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, Potter Stewart's famous line about uh, 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 pornography. 
can't define it, but I know when I see it. Um, so that's how that's how I get started with my stories. I, uh, in this instance, I had a really good idea for a setting. I had a really good idea for characters. And then I just hunted around until I found a story that went zing of the strings of my heart. Do you, uh, you said you had an idea for a setting. Do you go, do you decide what setting you want and go to the country that you are going to be researching? Or do you go to the country first and say, hey, this would be a great setting for a story? Or how does that, how does that work? And how does your research work? I mean, when you're describing buildings and various things, how do you, what do you do? Is that because you've been there or not? Um, these are really, really good questions. Um, what I do is I find a setting that has intrinsic danger and violence humming in the background, and then I overlay a story on it. Because if you had somebody with murderous intent and they were at Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, they'd stand out like a sore thumb. Whereas if you have somebody who's got violent intent and they're in a country that's been seeing some violence, they can hide in the uh, in the atmosphere of violence, right? So I, I, I trend to, tend to find, uh, start that way, a place that's already got some in, in, incessant uh, damage going on anyway. Uh, and then once I've written the book or I've written the first draft and I think, yeah, yeah, this is really, this is really happened. It's really good. Then I go and do the research. I've been super duper fortunate to um, uh, get to travel to uh, many of the places I write about, almost all of them. Um, uh, um, and uh, okay, I got, um, I got fired from a job at Portland City Hall as the uh, communications director for the mayor. And they fired me poorly enough that all of a sudden I had a whole bunch of money in my hands and I got to use it traveling. So it's, it's, it's an ill wind that doesn't blow some good, right? Um, anyway, um, there was a, um, I was working on a book uh, for St. Martin's Press and it had the character Daria Gibron, who's a former Israeli spy. She was the protagonist of two of the books there. And I wanted the book to end in, uh, um, uh, Serbia in the capital of Serbia. So I thought, okay, that'll be interesting. And so I, my, my buddy, Tim and I uh, traveled all over the uh, former Yugoslavia and we ended up there in uh, uh, Belgrade, uh, Serbia. And we were not sure what we we're looking for. I'm just taking notes all the time. And we came around a corner and there was the Serbian parliament building, uh, and on the kitty corner from it was a building that had been five stories tall, but was now three stories tall and had been smashed. And you could see missile holes in the walls. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So uh, I started taking photos of it. And as I did, a Jeep came around the corner, a Humvee or something, came around the corner and soldiers jumped out and they said, no, no, you're a tourist. You don't get to take photos of that. I said, what is this? Because well, it got, it got blown up about 10 years ago and we leave it up so the parliament can see it. And they said, I said, well, who did that? And they went, well, you did. The Americans blew this up. What? My bad. Sorry about that. So I went and did the research and they were right. They were right. Um, uh, uh, during the, uh, near the end of the uh, civil war in Yugoslavia, um, the fellow who was the ambassador to the peace talks there from the United States, I'm lacking, I'm missing his name this very second. I apologize for that. Shoot, I can't think. He uh, called President uh, uh, Jimmy Carter and said, do not let up on these, these the, the, the Syrians. We need to bring them, or the Serbians, we need to bring them to the negotiating table. And the only way for them to get to the negotiating table is to bomb them. And if you hit them from the air, they'll come to the table. And if you don't, they won't. And uh, the president okayed it. So one night at three in the morning when there was nothing but a couple of janitors in the building, a, a U.S. Uh, naval vessel in the Adri uh, Ad Adriatic fired three JDAM missiles across the length of the width of Serbia, hit that building, shattered it, demolished it, and uh, the peace talks began two weeks later. So um, I, I just thought, well, now that I know that building's there and now I know the origins of the building, of course the final scene of the book's going to take place there. So I dashed home as soon as I could erased the last hundred pages of the book of that book, rewrote it so I could have the final scene in that building. Because why are you that what a set piece? Of course I'm going to use that. So my research generally starts with I a place I think I want to go. Then I go there and find out about does the research. And then I go back through and I layer in my clues. The other thing that I do, and I, I should uh, I should mention this. I don't have one of them here. I'm actually gonna step off camera for one second. 
I write longhand in steno pads and with pencils. Uh, people are always freaked out when they hear that. But my first drafts are or, or in, in steno pads. Um, and I write in the morning that way and then I translate it in the computer in the evening. And um, when I'm writing a first draft, I will often say, da 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 he walked into a bar and then I put in brackets the word scripto, C-S-C-R-I-P-T-O bracket. And what that means is I'm going to describe this place, but I don't got to do it in the first draft. I can do it later in subsequent drafts. So I get to the end, scripto, get to the end, scripto, get done, travel to someplace, take a lot of notes. Katie is a tremendous photographer and she takes photos of the places we go to. Then I go back and I layer in all those descriptions of what places looked like and what they smelled like and what they tasted like. Um, we have a, uh, we, I had a, a finale of one of the books took place at the cathedral in Milan, uh, fantastic Gothic cathedral in Milan, Italy. And uh, Katie and I went and uh, literally walked the scene. We, you know, the bad guys are going to enter from that side and, and Daria Gibran is going to enter from this side. And this is what they'd hear. And this is what they'd see. And this is what it would be like on that day. And then the, the, the chase, and we got to choreograph a fight scene and a chase scene, went back and rewrote it and put all that stuff in. And it's, it's a lovely and, and tremendously fun way to write. Um, it's, it's, it's my, uh, it's my jam. I really enjoy that a lot. By the way, I should point out for, for the listeners, every writer, every successful writer has a zone. Your zone might not be like my zone, probably isn't. The longhand thing they do with the steno pad, the pencils, that works for me, won't work for most other people. If anybody ever tells you there's only one way to be a writer, they're full of it. Uh, whatever works for you, works for you. And, and, and I get so angry when I go to the conventions and people say, Authors must always do blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, they don't. Whatever. Whatever works, works. So. More questions or should I? Well, I just have another question. And that is, um, how, does, how does your journalism inform your novel writing? Um, I mean, I've been a journalist. I understand what that's like. But it's a, it's a lot different than being a, a, novel, a novelist. And then it's not always that different either in terms of you know, the way you write. Um, you talk about doing notes and doing things and, you know, layering things in, but as a journalist, you have to write on the spot. How does that, does that help? Uh, your, does that experience as a journalist help or, or hinder? Uh, very, very helpful. Super duper helpful. Um, when you go to the murder mystery conventions or the thriller conventions, there are maybe a fifth of us are journalists and the other uh, four fifths aren't. I'm guessing about that number. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And pretty much all of the journalists say the same thing, which one is we don't miss deadline. Uh, we don't have writer's block. Nobody in journalism has writer's block. Uh, we don't call it writer's block. We call it unemployment. Um, if, if you get, came back from a school board meeting and said, the muse is not with me today, the editors would laugh and replace you with a 20 year old. You know, it's, it's so consequently, there's no such thing as, as, as writer's block in, in our world. Um, secondly, I can tell you that there are some guys who are pretty, some people who are pretty good, pretty good journalists who can describe a basketball game or a football game or, or a crime scene, whatever. But I'm telling you right now, that person who goes to a school board meeting and comes back and writes a compelling story, that's a great storyteller because those things are, can be stultifyingly dull. And what are they about? They're about your kids and your pocketbook. So of course they should be interesting, but they're generally not, unless you find that one great storyteller who knows how to do that. Well, I was a school board writer for many, many years, a school uh, journalist. Um, that was my gig and I enjoyed it a lot. I also covered the legislature, enjoyed it a lot. I was the bureau chief for the Salem Citizen Journal uh, at the Capitol Bureau. So uh, I, a lot of my writing is influenced by the fact that I'm very fast uh, and I'm also not uh, married to my written word. If I write in the morning for you know 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, get in the evening, look at it and think I don't like it, I rip it up. I'm not at anything. Um, and I know other writers who would simply have, you know, would freak out if they, if they, if that happened. I always like to say that I worked my way through college as a janitor at a Dotson dealership. And the very worst day I had as a writer is much better than the best day I had as a janitor. So, um, and by the way, for, for your li listeners, Dotson is Nissan. So I know I'm dating myself. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, that my journalism has a huge influence in how I write. And, uh, and it makes me really, really fast. And it also makes me a pretty good describer of things. But I also, in high school and in college and after college, I also was a theater geek and I, I performed in, in plays. And that helps me a lot because I choreograph scenes and I block scenes. And, um, and it's helped. And 
that's uh, that background has helped me a great deal. The third thing I would say is, and by the way, this is a trick for any would-be writers or, or successful writers out there. When I'm starting a book and I've got my primary important characters, five, six important, really important characters, I cast them. I decide it's going to be a movie or a TV show, and I figure out which actors are going to play these roles. And when I say actors, it can be somebody who's a box office star today. It could be David Niven, who died 30 years ago. Doesn't matter to me. I'm not paying him his wages. But if, but if I need David Niven in a role, I got him. It can be one time I cast my high school principal because he had a certain way of walking and talking. Um, and then as I'm writing the dialogue, I write it with that voice in my head. And I actually take you know, uh, photos from off the internet of the actors uh, so I can see them too. And I can tell you right now that if you're writing a scene for, uh, uh, for uh, Idris Elba, you're gonna write it differently than if you're writing a scene for David Niven. You simply would write it differently. It makes, and you, that way your dialogue will sparkle and it won't sound like you, it'll sound like somebody else. So those are my three things. Like journalism makes me fast and a good describer of things. My theater background is good for choreography and staging and blocking. And then that idea of casting the book early on. So I'm writing dialogue for specific voices so that people don't sound like Dana. Those are my, that's the secret sauce for me. All right. Well, keep on, keep on talking. Uh, do you have anything else you want to say about the, the latest book or next year's book? Well, the, the book that's coming out now, um, it, uh, that is, I forget that it's out. Um, I got to do lots of the scenes in Spain. And I got to say, I really like Spain. I enjoy Spain a great deal. Uh, Catalin is from Spain. She is uh, Spanish on her father's side. And her father was a cousin of the king, uh, a distant nephew or something. I, I can't remember the relationship the second. But I mean, she, she was born super rich. And her mom is Algerian and uh, Muslim. And her father is Spanish and Catholic. So um I, what I really wanted to do in this book is they've got this secret job where they're uh, they're essentially criminals. They kidnap people and take them to the International Criminal Court. That is, at the end of the day, a criminal act. Um, but what I thought would be really fun was to um, have a, uh, the, the crimes that in this in this book, uh, Shiraco head into Spain, head into uh, her near her family, and then at some point actually encompass her family. And she and Michael have to make the decision: Do we keep our anonymity? Do we keep hidden? Uh, or do we admit who we are to to my family? Uh, so that was going to be the that was going to be the B story, the 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 tension that she's undergoing in that book. Uh, I I'm going to say honestly, I um, I love writing Catalan. She's tremendous fun. Uh, she grew up uh, incredibly rich. Her father is a liberal lawmaker, and uh, um, um, he sits on 18 different boards of directors of this, that, and the other thing. Her mother is an academic and a journalist. Uh, and uh, wears the headscarf and is a, a devout Muslim. And uh, Kathleen, um, uh, when she was a teenager, um, you know, we talk about 9-11 today, but uh, for the Spanish, it was the bombing of the buses and the trains in Madrid took place six years later. And she saw that and, and she saw all that just terrorism and she joined the army the next day, scandalized her parents. And when she was in the army, they discovered that she had uh, competed in the biathlon for Spain, which means that she is a sharpshooter. And so she went from being a soldier uh, to a spy. And then she went from a spy to being an assassin really fast. And her mom and dad think of her. And by the way, they tell their parents, Michael's parents and her parents, that they've got this kind of bureaucratic job and they live on Cyprus and their work life is very, very boring. So she's got to decide, do I tell my liberal father, my liberal mother, um, that I've been an assassin and that currently I am kidnapping people for a living? Um, and so that's the that's the dynamic going on in that book. And that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, and also we took a big chunk of that book takes place in Barcelona, Barcelona. Um, they pronounce it with a TH when you're there. So it gets confusing when you get back. And Katie and I got to go to uh, Barcelona and to walk and uh, to to uh, 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 walk the scenes where they are. And that city is just gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's uh, unbelievably amazing. So there, there was a, there was a real uh, luxury in that one. So as you can see, I have yet to set any of my books in a crappy, crappy place that my wife would not like to visit. This is not coincidental. Uh, one of these days I'm going to do a story uh, in some terrible town in the middle of Montana. And Katie's going to say, on your own, baby. Uh, but uh, that ain't happened. so far. That's not happening. Also, for those of you who are questioning it, let me tell you, and this is completely legal. I get to write off all my trips. The reason I get to do all these trips is because 
they're a tax write-off for me because they're part of my business. So I get to go to these beautiful, beautiful places in the world, come back, write off virtually everything except food. Um, uh, and uh, that, that's the reason I'm, I can afford going to these places. So that's a, it's a mitzvah, it's a luxury. Uh, so the, the first book was in uh, France and the former Yugoslavia and obviously Cyprus where their headquarters is. And um, in the, the, in the French scenes are in the Loire Valley, uh, which was tremendous fun. Uh, and then the second book uh, is, is Spain. And the third book is going to be Venice, where I adore Venice and been there many times and heading back soon. So it's a, it, is a, it is a super duper luxury to be able to go to these places. I know that I'm lucky beyond words that I get to go to these places. Uh, the other thing I'm going to say really quickly about travel and books, <laughs> and it's apropos, by the way, at the times we're in, living in. Um, in 1992, I read I think two. Yeah, I read a, a story in the New Yorker called "The Crash Detectives," and it was about the in, uh, National Transportation Safety Board go teams, the people who go to an airline crash and figure out what went wrong. And it was this great, brilliant, tremendous story, uh, and just stunningly brilliant. And about three, four, five years later, I thought, you know, I got to write about this. I got to write about the people. Who do, I got to do a fictional book about this because what they do is fascinating. Quick anecdote, I, it's both real and I also put in that book. The book was called Crashers. Um, um, sound travels through an airplane, obviously, but sound also travels through the aluminum skin of an airplane, but it travels faster through the aluminum than it does through the air. So on a cockpit voice recorder, they hear a thunk. They can measure, they'll actually hear a thunk thunk, and they can measure how long it took between the two thunks, figure out exactly what it fell. If it's a clang, then it's metal on metal. If it's a clank, it's metal on wood or plastic. And they, they can figure out what broke based on that audio signature. Isn't that fascinating? Um, uh, it, when uh, tiny, tiny, tiny light bulbs explode, they leave a different fracture pattern if they're hot than they, the fracture pattern when they're, uh, when they're uh, cold. So for a famous uh, 90, early 90s crash outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they were able to gather up all of the lights that were on the cockpit panels and put them back into place and study which ones were hot and which ones were cold. And we're able to recreate by animation exactly what the pilots were seeing in the moment of the crash. Boom, my head blew up. It's fascinating stuff. So I really, really want to do that book. So around 1999, I finally wrote it. I uh, spent the next year trying to find an agent um, and uh, did. And the agent was so excited he flew to Portland to sign me. It was uh, August of that year. Uh, that next coming year. And he said, this is great. We'll do a hardback paperback version. We're going to take this to Hollywood. We're going to make a movie out of this. Cannot wait. That was August of 2001. In September of 2001, New York was attacked. Now in my book, which was about terrorists who bring down multiple airliners and a third of which took place in New York City, suddenly became the least marketable book on the planet. Um, we ended up having to put that thing on a shelf for 10 years before we uh, because all the publishers are in Manhattan, they're all, all in lower Manhattan, and nobody, but nobody, but nobody would touch that book. So Crashers, which came out in 2010, uh, was a book that I'd been sitting on my shelf or on my computer uh, since uh, 1999, waiting for the world to calm down. I got to tell you, I'm not complaining and kvetching. I lost the least of anybody involved with that thing. So, uh, And I eventually got a book that I adore, and I'm proud about to this day. I love that book. Um, got uh, finally got published but that's an example of of, of uh, sometimes the travel and the research and the rips from the headlines that can bite you in the butt if you're not careful well in this case it was you ripped it from the headlines before it became a headline yep yeah um and uh, one other question you uh mentioned that you cast characters uh for your books did who did you cast for sirocco all right here's what i'm going to tell you I'm not going to tell you. And the reason for that is I had gone to, I'd been using this trick for years and years. And I went to a couple of conventions and I told people who I had cast for books that were out then. And sometimes they were like, oh, that's interesting. And sometimes they're like, oh, I'm disappointed. That's not who I saw as the character. And they're, 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 the fun part of the book uh, diminished for them because clearly they, they were reading it wrong. No, it wasn't wrong. It's how they pictured it. And it's perfectly fine. I had no problem with that whatsoever. But because of that, I learned early on that people will be disappointed because they, most of us, I do, this is true. When I'm reading a book, sitting on my couch with, with Katie and Violet, I cast uh, the stories and the books I'm reading all the time. I can imagine Idris Elba in this one or, or whomever. Um, Joan Allen would be perfect in this role. 
So um, I, I don't tell people now. I will tell you that dark because it's done and gone. I'm not ever going to get back, go back to those books. I was trying to find somebody to be Daria Gibran, who was the Israeli so, former Israeli soldier uh, who was in Crashers and Breaking Point and Ice Cold Kill and Gunmetal Heart. And at the time, I had seen a kind of obscure film with an Israeli actress who had served time in the uh, Israel Defense Force, as everybody does over there. And uh, she was about the right height for what I wanted. She had the right hair color. And if she had this Israeli accent, I thought she was just going to be perfect. So I cast her and I used her as my voice for all of those books. That uh, obscure actress went on to be Gal Gadot, who was Wonder Woman now and is doing really, really well. But I was casting Gal Gadot in, in stories a long time ago. So I, um, I like to think that I discover her and she's not been grateful at all. She never calls, never writes, whatever. Uh, fact of the matter is I never bothered ever telling her, but that, that was one of the casting. I get kind of a kick out of the way you describe uh, your characters um, when you say uh, the the uh, woman in your book is a lot of fun. And you really enjoy her, and then it, as a teenager she did this, and her she grew up rich and so forth. Um, how much of your characters are yourself? How much do you? How do you get to know your characters? Some authors say that the characters talk to them. Um, how how do you develop your characters so that you have this easygoing relationship with them? Here's a controversial answer to that. I think, and boy, I know that I know writers who will disagree with me a lot on this one, but I think you have to have protagonists you can root for. And so I write characters that I care about, you know, characters that I want to know about their lives. Uh, and I want to spend a year of my life or six months of my life uh, with them. Um, now, one of the most um, uh, best-selling mystery write books of the last 10 years was Gone Girl. Uh, super popular book, made just tons and tons and tons, sold gobs, made it into a movie. I didn't like it and couldn't finish it. And the reason was I didn't like the husband and I didn't like the wife and I couldn't care. I was like a pox on both your houses. I, I want you both out of this book because I'm tired of you. Um, so I'm of the belief that you really have to have somebody that you can sit down and root for. Um, so I try and write protagonists who are who have that going for them. Uh, they're not much like me whatsoever. Um, when I was a much younger writer, my first book uh, was published while I was or it was written when I was a student at Clackamas Community College in Oregon City. It was published while I was at Lewis and Clark. I was quite young for that first book, and um, uh, my dad came to me and said, uh, "I understand that uh, the protagonists are often part of the personality of the uh, of the author, and I can't help but noticing your protagonists are an alcoholic and a gay guy. Anything you need to tell me about Dana?" So. Uh, there, I have very, very little in common other than um, I, I, you know, a sense of doing right and sense of trying to make things correct. I guess as a journalist, I've been trying to. I'm a super duper optimistic person. You can't do journalism if you're not optimistic. Otherwise, it would be a futile effort and would drive you crazy. Um, and so that, that, that little bit of that. The other thing I'm going to say now, and I'm going to I'm going to out myself. I'm also going to date myself. Um, when I was growing up. Uh, uh, the Avengers was a TV show out of England and uh, Diane Rigg played Emma Peel, nine years old, crazy in love with this tall, leggy brunette who wore leather cat suits, bonkers about her. I was still in love with her when she was on Game of Thrones three years ago. I am, I, I, she was my first major crush. And so I find myself writing brunette, tall brunettes who, have, who, who carry guns on their hips. <laughs> and I, I really blame Diane Rigg for that and, and Emma Peel. Uh, also, there was a comic strip uh, uh, called Modesty Blaze. Um, the guy who wrote it, uh, 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 O'Donnell, Peter O'Donnell, started in 1961 and wrote it until 2000 and when he passed away. And he wrote every single strip six strips a week, 61 to 2000, never missed any. And it was about a woman who was, um, had been a crim uh, an orphan and a criminal and her, uh, her lieutenant back when she was involved in crime, a guy named Willie Smith. Uh, that's not true, it's um, Willie Garvin. 
Willie Smith is a friend of mine, Willie Garvin. And it's, uh, and they, uh, they retired from crime and they moved to England and they just get involved with stuff they shouldn't get involved with. And I was super influenced by Peter O'Donnell's wonderful, wonderful modesty blaze strip, which what remember created in 61. And it's about a woman who's in charge and a very macho tough guy who is her Lieutenant and takes orders from her and doesn't mind doing it. It's fine doing it. And they're not lovers by the way, either. They're, they're uh, really good friends. Although in that case, there's a protagonist, a sidekick. Um, uh, so I was super duper influenced by who, one of I consider the great one of the great storytellers of the 21st century, 20, 20th century, um, Peter O'Donnell. So um, there was a movie, by the way, called Modesty Blaze. It sucks. Do not see it. You, you should run the other direction if, if you ever see it uh, um, being offered. Horrible film. But um, so that's where that's uh, for my female protagonists. So they tend to have be of a kind, Daria or Catalan. I, I'm blaming Emma Peel for that. And do they talk to you? Do they tell you what the story is? Yeah, they're, that's really common in in, uh, in mystery writing. It's probably in all writing. From time to time, you'll have an idea where your story is going, and the protagonist won't go there. They just, which is, they just won't. They just will get recalcitrant. And you're like, damn it, I'm trying to write this scene. Will you please uh, just read your dialogue? And sometimes it just doesn't work, and it just doesn't work. And I'm a lot smarter today than I used to be, and I no longer try and force those scenes. If it doesn't work, it's because my little voice in the back of my head is telling me it was a bad uh, bad decision and that I need to uh, listen to the characters and, and do what they say. And because I don't outline, and because, I got to say this too, um, I don't write for audiences. I don't write for editors and publishers and my literary agent. I write for me. I write books that I would enjoy. Uh, that's my, I am my first reader. And when I get to that point in a book where I'm thinking to myself, I wake up in the morning, I think, man, I put my protagonist in a bad situation. I don't know how she's going to get out of it. I can't wait to find out. That's when I know I'm on the right track. So. What do you like to read casually? Do you read, it sounds like you read a lot of mysteries and thrillers. Do you read other things as well that uh, informs your writing? Uh, let me say this, and people are going to sneer and laugh when I say this, but growing up, I read comic books, Marvel comics. And to this day, I'm a collector of comic books because I think that the, some, some of the greatest storytellers and how to, ca how to do an action sequence, the people who worked at Marvel comics and DC comics are absolute masters. And you can disrespect the, the medium if you choose to do so. For me, I find it really great. If I've had a really stressful day and it's been, I've been doing journalism for however many hours, I can tell you that sitting down and reading a comic book will just chill me right out. Uh, so I, uh, I, I'm still to this day, I'm a collector of comics and you can get them online now. So they don't, you don't have boxes of them in your garage anymore either. Uh, and I don't read much um, nonfiction. As a journalist myself, I don't read other journalism books because I've just spent 10 hours in a newsroom. The last thing I want to do is write, read about journalism. So uh, I, I mostly read mysteries and thrillers and I like series books. So I find that, you know, as I, I said, I'm my, I'm my own first reader. And so the other things I read are a lot like mine. I think Meg Gardner has a series going on right now called Unsub Series. She's had three of them out. Dead brilliant, marvelous, just bonkers. Robert Cray, C-R-A-I-S. He's had that Joe Pike and Elvis Cole series that he's been writing those. I swear to goodness, he's been writing those things since the 80s. Um, he, that, he built that one to last. And those are, those are money in the bank. T. Jefferson Parker is a great series writer, um, just tremendous. A uh, younger guy named uh, Greg Hurwitz is doing the Orphan X series right now. I think they're tremendous. Very big, big, big fan of his. Um, uh, K.J. Howe, uh, Kimberly Howe, uh, writes kind of like me. Her books seem so much like my books, and she's a friend now, too. So we, we both have set stories at one time or another, short scenes in a very small village in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we're the only two writers in the world that have ever heard of this damn town. Uh, and both of us have set uh, uh, Mostar, M-O-S-T-A-R, and we both set scenes there. So that's why we laugh about how similar we are as writers. So no, mostly I read the same kind of stuff I write. And you mentioned, this is completely off the subject, but you mentioned that you, um, you like libraries. Tell me what it is about libraries that you like. This is a great way to kind of end our conversation. We're getting very close to the ending. So tell me why you like libraries. Uh, libraries um, have a role in any community that is hard to, hard to describe. It's not like a school. Schools have a role, but a library uh, has a more, uh, more of a role of 
tell me community, what is it that you need that we can do? And uh, libraries are flexible and fleet. They can stop on a dime and change course. Uh, you need terminals, we'll have free terminals. You need job help, we got job help. Uh, you need this, you need that, that's what we can do. Schools aren't like that. Schools do one mission, they do it really, really well. I'm a huge fan of public schools. Uh, they have a, a, they have a, they work under a, um, uh, in loco parentis, which means they are the present, they are the parent at that scene uh, role uh, and libraries don't have that. So I love that they're super duper flexible. The other thing I love is that Northwest librarians are super, super um, uh, good for us Northwest authors. They like us, they help us out all the time. I remember I had a book that was published by a publisher in England and um, I, importing that book was going to be tremendously expensive. And I mentioned to libraries, the next book that's coming out is coming out from this English publisher and it's going to be really expensive and you probably, it's probably not worth it for you to get it. And I had library after library say, oh no, you're one of ours. Of course, we're going to get your book. Yes, that, that goes without saying. I will also say, by the way, that Powell's carried that book. And I found out later that Powell's was selling it at a loss because they couldn't sell it or what they could buy it for. And they were like, you're an office writer. We don't care. Shut up. We're good. Um, so the thing I like about libraries is they're dexterous and deft. They will move with the times. They'll offer that which the community needs. Most of them are supported by uh, city council, hint, hint, city council uh, in Cannon Beach. Um, uh, and uh, that's that for me, libraries are the ultimate utility belt. They're the ultimate um, uh, Swiss army knife. They are good for what the community needs when the community needs it. All right, well, we are coming toward the end of our hour. Um, if you have anything else you would like to add, you've got um, two or three minutes to do that. So what would you like to add? My website is danahainesmystery.com. It's all one word, Dana Haynes Mystery. And uh, I, I, I have a little blog that I, uh, that I occasionally fill there uh, called Who Put the Laughter in Slaughter? Just because I always wanted to, wanted to write a book called that and I couldn't find a story for it. Uh, and um, Katie and I are so honored to do this. We're just huge fans of Cannon Beach. We're huge fans of the Cannon Beach Bookstore and of the Cannon Beach Library. And uh, it's an honor to do this. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Well, Dana, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. And it's, it's been really fun to talk to you. And you're obviously excited after even after nine books and all that time in journalism, you're still really excited about writing and uh, taking adventures. And I really appreciate it. I can relate to a lot of what you said because I've been to a lot of those places, had a similar experience in Yugoslavia, by the way, got too close to a building and the guards came out and said, no, no, you can't be there. So I totally understand that. And kind of the fear that goes through you when that happens, it's a, it's a little weird. <laughs> but uh, so I really appreciate uh, your time and your interest and your support of the library. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate having you here. An absolute honor. Thank you all very much. Okay. Uh, this is the end of our first day of our, for our next year of Northwest Author Series, and we are, really appreciate you joining us. Please join us again next month for our next author, and you'll learn all about that in the coming weeks. Thanks again. Bye-bye.